Welcome everybody to today's lecture on uh, Byzantium and the Mongols. And I would like to thank Francesca Fiaschetti for inviting me to present this uh, topic to you. Um, my name is uh, Ekaterina Mitsiu. I'm currently working at a project of the Göttingen Academy of Sciences, but I am also a guest uh, researcher here at the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And uh, today I'm going to talk, as I already uh, uh, mentioned, uh, about the Mughals and Byzantium. But uh, as you will see, uh, the focus is not only on these two separate states, but uh, I will put them in a global perspective. Today's presentation uh, will start with the perception of the world in the 13th and 14th century on the base of the Mughal expansion, comparing Byzantine and Mughal perspectives also with the Western Christian ones. Then we will look on possible axes of uh, Byzantium and the wider Mughal world. One is towards the Ilkhanate, both on terms of secular and ecclesiastical politics, and the other connection, as we are going to see, is via the Black Sea to Russia onwards, uh, to Central Asia and China. Um, my lecture aims at demonstrating the position of Byzantium in the global late uh, Middle Ages in connection to the Mughal expansion. The change in the perception of the world uh, due to the Mughal um, uh, expansion can be detected in various works, uh, as for example in this um, uh, work. This is the work of Marino Sanudo Torcello. It's actually a map. Uh, which uh, accompanies the uh, work of Torcello. Uh, and this work uh, tries to uh, 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 mobilize the Westerners for a new crusade, in order to plan a new crusade. Um, Marino uh, Sanudo Torcello was uh, a well known, famous Venetian statesman and diplomat. And uh, interestingly, this map was created by Pietro Vesconte, one of the most famous cartographers of his time. Um, and Vesconde left himself depicted in this, uh, uh, in, an, uh, in the so-called uh, Vesconde Atlas, as you can see in the um, uh, image on the uh, uh, on the right, and um, it is in a way a traditional map. It contains Europe, Asia, and Africa. But if we um, focus, if we can uh, could focus on the details, then we see that it contains more details. Uh, in uh, and it, it shows routes and places. Uh, towards the uh, Mughal uh, sphere of influence uh, in the Western Eurasian um, area. Another example uh, is uh, the um, Pratica della Mercatura. It's a handbook for trade by Francesco Balducci Pegolotti at the end of the end of the 13th century, beginning of the 14th. Who uh, in this work he wrote about the marketplaces in the Mediterranean and beyond, and about the commodities which could be exchanged between these places. In this book, Pratica della Mercatura, you can also find the uh, mercantile connections uh, all the way to China, uh, that is, all the commodities that came to the Mediterranean from the Mughal sphere. So it, it is a testimony, it is, a, it is a, um, a, another proof uh, of this Mughal expansion and the change also of the perspective of the Westerners due to 
this uh, Mogul expansion. Uh, for instance, also in the book of uh, Tosello, uh, we find a description of the routes who run from the Mediterranean across the realm of the Ilhanate, for example, in the uh, Indian Ocean. And um, it demonstrates also the opportunities uh, this uh, would provide uh, in order to establish a trade embargo against the Mamluks, who at that time were the uh, main uh, enemy of, they were identified as the principal enemy uh, for the Westerners in the Near East. Also, the strategical thinking was modified uh, according to the new opportunities provided uh, by the establishment of uh, this uh, Mughal uh, rule. Here you see a depiction of the routes as they are described in Dorcello's uh, uh, work and also on the work of Pegolotti. Um, there is, you, you can see there is awareness of the uh, long distance connectivity up to India and uh, this will uh, be used actually, uh, for example, by the Western ecclesiastics as we are about to see in order to expand their um, sphere of influence. Uh, for instance, uh, regarding the island of Kish uh, in the Persian Gulf, uh, which was a central uh, hub also for maritime uh, contacts between the Ilkhanate and uh, the uh, Indian Ocean uh, all the way to uh, China. For this change of the perspective, a significant role played uh, the Mughal invasion in Western Eurasia, which affected first Eastern Europe in the 2020s, but uh, then it was really modified, it really modified the political landscape um, uh, with the permanent than uh, occupation of these um, lands by the Mongols from the 2030s onwards. And uh, also um, this invasion uh, led uh, later on all the way to Central Europe in the 2040s, uh, although the Mongols did not occupy um, for, uh, in a permanent base, um, for example, Hungary or Poland. On the other side, uh, in the Near East, in the 2040s, the Seljuk Sultanate in Anatolia was defeated. We will come back a little bit later on that, which was relevant for the Byzantine Empire, for the Byzantine sphere of influence. And in 1258, uh, it culminated in the conquest of Baghdad, the traditional uh, center of the Muslim world. And also that meant the um, destruction of the Abbasid uh, Caliphate. For the Byzantine Empire now, the most decisive date uh, will be the year 1204, when the capital of Byzantium, Constantinople, was captured by the Crusaders of the Fourth Crusade and of the, uh, by the Venetians. Uh, this had as a result the uh, uh, fragmentation of the Eastern Mediterranean, of the former Byzantine Empire anyway, but it fragmented uh, the Eastern Mediterranean uh, in a, a large degree with the formation of various Latin but also Greek states um, uh, there where former the Byzantine Empire existed. Uh, for the Byzantine case, uh, three states are of interest, uh, three Greek states that were formed um, in um, uh, Western Asia Minor, in, uh, in Central Greece, Northwestern Greece, Epirus, and the third one around the city of Trapezont, Trapezont today. And these Greek successor states tried to recover Constantinople from the Latins. Um, 
the most successful of them was the so-called Empire of Nicaea. Nicaea is today the city of Iznik in Turkey, uh, in Bithynia. Uh, and this exile state, a government in, in exile, a state in exile, uh, this um, uh, state, uh, the Empire of Nicaea, had the center uh, the the Bithynian city, Nicaea. It is quite interesting that, as we will notice later, this city played an important role then in the Ottoman expansion. And uh, having a center uh, this territory, it uh, managed to expand to the, all the way down to the Western Asia Minor. But as uh, this expansion took place, recovering uh, um, uh, these territories, it came to conflict with the Seljuk state, with the Sultanate of the uh, Rum Seljuk. And um, there was a very decisive uh, battle in 1211 uh, in Antiochia. Uh, where the Byzantines, the Lascarids, the Lascarid dynasty uh, won. It was a decisive uh, victory also for the, uh, let's say, for the um, uh, mor uh, moral, uh, moral um, uh, 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 sentiment of the uh, uh, government, this state in exile. The Nicaeans felt that they had um, accomplished a great victory against an enemy, and at the same time they had to fight the Latin um, Empire of Constantinople. Uh, during this period, all of these states had to fight in various uh, frontiers. It was not only that they were fighting against one enemy, it was a constant fight to the west, to the east, and sometimes to the north, depending on, on which state we are talking about. And the Empire of Nasir was not an exception on that. And uh, it was the most successful of the Greek um, uh, states uh, after the 1204 uh, capture of Constantinople. And um, it was actually the state that recovered Constantinople. That's why we call it the most successful of them. And of course, it, uh, it was of importance for uh, the Byzantines uh, in Western Asia Minor what was happening when the Mughals arrived in Anatolia. The Mughals had at first to confront the Seljuk, the Sultanate uh, of the Rum Seljuk. Uh, and this happened um, in a, a very decisive battle, the Battle of Kusedag where the Seljuk lost and then they had to uh, accept the uh, sovereignty of the Mughals. In a way, it came to a balance between the, um, uh, the states in Anatolia and um, Nicaea, the Empire of Nicaea, was not actually uh, very much affected by the Mughal uh, presence in this um, area. Um, the, um, this doesn't mean that the Nicaeans were not in fear of what will happen. They tried to have diplomatic relations with the Mughals. In, um, in a narrative, in a, um, in a uh, historiographical text, uh, we hear a very precise measures that were uh, not only on the diplomatic sphere, but on, um, on, on, on a matter of imperial ideology and of organizing the state. Uh, one of the Lascari emperors, John III Batadzis, uh, tried, when he heard about the um, uh, expansion of the Mughals, uh, he uh, tried to accumulate um, uh, commodities in case uh, a siege or uh, a devastation is going to happen. So he tried to have a backup for, all, uh, for uh, the danger that the Mughals um, posed. His son, the successor of his, uh, Theodore II, when he heard about the Mughals and they had this diplomatic action, and there was a meeting between um, uh, Mughal ambassadors uh, and uh, Lascaris and Nicaeans, he tried to demonstrate, he tried to impress the Mughals and to make them feel like he had to deal, they had to deal with a powerful uh, state. And he made an exhibition of the glory and the splendor of the Byzantine uh, court at that time. Um, so, uh, in a way, we can say that they were acting on various frontiers, but definitely they took advantage of um, 
the fact that the Seljuks were the ones that had to face this um, first uh, difficult uh, phase of the Mughal expansion, and in a way they were um, uh, they were in between the the, the Byzantines and um, the uh, Mughals as a, a secure zone for them. And uh, the Byzantines actually took advantage. They they profited from the fact of this weakness of the of its neighbor of their neighbors, not only in the Anatolian frontier, not only in Asia Minor, but also on the Balkans. And uh, the Balkans had to face also Mughal attacks, and especially what uh, the state, uh, the Kingdom of Bulgaria. Uh, they uh, they were um, facing attacks from the uh, so-called Golden Horde, and uh, you see here we have these two frontiers on the other, one side the um, uh, the Balkan and then uh, Anatolia, uh, and in between is the Byzantine Empire uh, with the center of Constantinople after 1261 when the city was uh, recovered by. Uh, Michael the Eighth Paleologos. You can see him in uh, illumination uh, of a manuscript of the 14th century, uh, with all the imperial uh, insignia of the Byzantine emperor. So you see, Byzantium was in between two Mughal frontiers: one from the north, which was very easy to attack, also the Balkan territories, and one other frontier was the Anatolian. Uh, but in a way, uh, it it was at least for a period um, it was uh, in the advantage of the byzantine uh, rulers and uh, especially michael the eighth who called himself a new constantine a new founder let's say of the city the city of constantinople and um, um, he had followed um, a very let's say a nice policy uh, uh, policy regarding the uh, various frontiers but of course it doesn't mean that okay they kept to try to keep the balance between uh, the various uh, Mughal uh, uh, polities and the uh, various enemies on the Balkans and on, on the on Asia Minor but Mughals were always uh, a fearful element, uh, especially for uh, the local populations in Asia Minor. And there is this famous um, incident, a very well known incident in the Byzantine, uh, uh, in a Byzantine uh, historiographical work about uh, a rumor that was spread in um, uh, February 1265 that the Mughals are coming. And you see, uh, that uh, this uh, caused a panic in the city where people were running all over the city, not knowing what to do. And uh, the thing is that uh, this rumor was created through a procession, a supplicatory procession that was uh, taking place early in the morning. And uh, this procession uh, took place in order to ask for the protection of God against this, uh, the Seljuks, Persians as the, they are called in the Greek source, and against the Tatars, Tohari, uh, here in the meaning of the Mongols. And um, uh, you see that as well also what um, the terminology is in the Greek source, and we will come back later on that. And here you see as well um, a city gate of the city of um, Nicaea. As we um, already said, um, Byzantium had to keep the balance between the new uh, 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 players in the area. And uh, we can say that it managed to arrange itself in this new geopolitical environment. Um, we must keep in mind that at that time, at about 12, after 1261, the Mongol Empire was fragmented in four polities, two of which were of relevance for um, uh, Byzantium. The one was the Golden Horde to the north of the Black Sea, relevant because it had the sovereignty over the Russian principalities, 
which was of importance for the ecclesiastical matter. We will come back to that later. And because the Golden Horde had the potential to attack uh, the uh, another uh, an important opponent of Byzantium, Bulgaria. On the other side um, was the uh, Ilkhanate, which emerged in Iran, Iraq, uh, and Syria, and it had the sovereignty over the Turkish principalities in Asia Minor, and therefore it was a direct neighbor for Byzantium. And then there were the Mamluks, and the Mamluk Sultanate. Uh, in 1255, it was founded around 1250. Uh, 50, um, the Mamluks were originally um, uh, slaves, warrior slaves. They had, um, they called a coup d'etat uh, and uh, they seized power and became lords over Egypt. But the situation was um, a little bit complicated from the fact that between the Golden Hall and the Ilkhanate there was a rivalry especially for the region um, around Caucasus. On the other hand, the Ilkhanate uh, was fighting with the Mamluks in Egypt. For uh, the, the, the rivalry here was about uh, who is going to control Syria. And then um, what happened was that the Golden Horde uh, made an alliance with the Mamluks against the Ilkhanate. And um, you see that Byzantium had to take into consideration these relations between these um, uh, states. Um, the Golden Horde um, would be Islamized. Um, we have some rulers already who became Muslims even, even before the Ilkhanate, although this was not still uh, a permanent uh, situation. Um, the Golden Horde and the Mamluks were dependent on uh, maritime contacts via Constantinople in order to keep their alliance alive. Um, that means that Constantinople was in a very important uh, geostrategic position as um, an intermediator between the Black Sea, the Golden Horde, uh, and the Mediterranean and the Mamluks. The Mamluks were eager to keep this um, channel, this connection open and alive because they were dependent from buying uh, new warrior slaves for their army. And these slaves came from the Black Sea region, uh, that is, the regions which were under the control of the Golden Horde. Both polities, Golden Horde and Mamluks, were very much interested in having good relations to Byzantium, and Michael VIII managed to establish these good diplomatic relations to both of them. And um, but he, he couldn't forget the fact that there was the Ilkhanate, and the Ilkhanate was an immediate, a, a, a very important neighbor in the um, uh, in Anatolia, and it had to be a very, a very sophisticated game to keep the balance between all these powers. Michael did manage, in a way, to keep. The, uh, to, to, to play very well this game, whereas his son was not so much, uh, success, uh, so much successful in this, but uh, the circumstances uh, also were uh, changing. Here you see exactly this connection of the Golden Horde with uh, the Mamluks via Byzantium and also the fact that the Byzantines had to uh, uh, have good relations as well with the Ilkhanate. The Byzantines followed a very well-known practice of theirs, uh, which was 
marriage policy, marriage diplomacy, we can call it. Um, Michael VIII um, said as bride to Hulegu, his um, daughter Maria, um, who, when she arrived, he, she had to marry Abaka because in the meantime Hulegu had died. And she is well known as uh, Mary or Maria of the Mongols. Um, you see here a depiction uh, of her uh, in the monastery um, of uh, Hora, today Kariye Jami in uh, Istanbul. Um, you can read uh, much more about her in the one reading that I sent you, uh, and you can read also her position and her contribution to the cultural life of, um, uh, in the uh, capital of uh, the Byzantine Empire, but also her contribution during her stay in, um, in the Ilkhanate. And um, here you see this well-known portrait of her. She is a nun uh, in this portrait. And uh, an interesting uh, detail is that she went to this uh, um, uh, marriage, accompanied by um, Theodosius Villardois, who was an Archimandrite, let's say, a uh, high official uh, in, the, in the monastery of Padokrato. Padokrato monastery in Constantinople was one of the largest and um, most important monasteries in the city. So uh, he went as a, um, a person, uh, as, a, as a, um, uh, somebody who would accompany uh, Mary of the Mongols. Uh, he later became Patriarch of Adioch. Uh, this is a very interesting detail, a very interesting information. Um, together with Maria traveled uh, also um, uh, the Patriarch of Antioch, of Simeon I, who were, was living in exile in Constantinople. Um, the, uh, but it's interesting about the presence of um, uh, the Patriarch of Antioch, because Antioch, the Patriarchate of Antioch, was responsible actually for the um, uh, ecclesiastic, uh, from an ecclesiastical uh, point of view, from a jur uh, the jurisdiction of ecclesiastical um, uh, influence, the Patriarchate of Antioch was responsible for the Christian Christians in Western Eurasia. Um, it's interesting, to, it's, it's very important here to mention that um, Maria returned to Constantinople at some time and um, she then founded uh, a monastery. You can see that on your right. This is the, um, the church of uh, Theotokos Muchliotisa, um, the mother of God of the Mongols, exactly because it was founded by Maria of the Mongols. And it's still uh, in, um, in, in Istanbul. You can uh, visit it there. Um, and uh, this church never became a mosque even after the capture of um, Constantinople by the Ottomans. We have several contacts from Westerners, various reports, various information from Westerners, who, and diplomatic contacts between the West and the Western ambassadors who traveled to Ilhane, traveled to uh, the Mamluk, who traveled um, all the way to China. Um, but we have very often um, also reports from uh, people who came from the East to the West, who traveled from the East to the West. One case is um, the embassy of Rabban Bar uh, Sauma, uh, who um, uh, was a, a Christian. Uh, he came from a Christian community in uh, Northeastern China. And he traveled to the West as uh, he was a clergyman. Uh, he came to service of the Ilkhanate, and in 1287 he uh, he uh, took over this um, embassy. Uh, and the plan was to um, uh, to establish, perhaps, to to succeed to persuade the West for an uh, for an alliance uh, against the Mamluks. 
the Ilkhans against the Mamluks together with the help of the Westerners. Um, for us, interesting is his um, travel uh, as such, the routes that he selected. He traveled uh, via Trapezunt and then uh, to Constantinople. And he provided uh, a vivid uh, description of the places he visited. He, in Constantinople, he went to the church of uh, Hagia Sophia, St. Sophia, and um, he was astonished by uh, this um, church. You can uh, see what he uh, uh, thinks about Hagia Sophia and Constantinople in the text of uh, on this uh, slide. Uh, he didn't stop in Constantinople, but he uh, went all the way to the west. He visited Rome, Avignon um, uh, in France, but also London. And it's quite interesting to read his uh, narrative because it gives the, um, the perspective of a Christian, of a Christian of the East, and how this person actually sees the, or regards the, uh, the Western Christianity. Another famous uh, traveler, this time from Byzantium, um, from Byzantium to the Ilkhanate, uh, was a scholar. Was the well-known Byzantine uh, scholar um, Georgios, uh, George Gregorios Gregory uh, Hioniadis. He first traveled to the Ilkhanate, uh, to the city of um, Mara. Uh, near Tabriz, which was the capital of the Ilhanate. Uh, and there they had um, established um, an astronomical observatory. That's why he went there. He wanted to um, expand his knowledge in astronomy. Um, this had been uh, the center of um, uh, for astronomers and scientists who uh, visited the place to, from the entire Islamic world, but as you see also from the Byzantium, from other territories, uh, even from China. It was a, a center of exchange of knowledge. People went there because they wanted to, to learn. It was like we gone out, I don't know, to Oxford to study. This was the place back then for the Byzantine scholar, um, uh, Hioniadis. And he was, um, uh, he studied uh, next to uh, Sham al-Din al-Bukhari and um, he, uh, the contribution of Hioniadis was that he translated, um, so that means he knew Arabic in Persian, and he went back to Constantinople at some point and he translated the findings um, they, they made there in, uh, in science. He translated these works into Greek, and in this way he modified the, um, uh, the level and the astronomical uh, knowledge. Uh, it's better to say he, he, he changed the astronomical knowledge of, the, of Byzantium. At the beginning of the 14th century, Byzantium um, once more started to get even more interested in astronomy and the contribution of Herniotis in that is, is unquestionable. His travels there took place via Trapezunt and uh, Herniotis was also supported by the emperor in Constantinople. Um, and you see, Trapezunt once more, which was the center of one of the Greek states in exile after 1204. Trapezunt continues its history, a, a history that correlates with the Byzantine, but sometimes it's, it's, it's different because it's a different geopolitical um, um, space there. Uh, Hioniadis uh, returned at some point to Constantinople. Here you see also Tabriz in order to get um, an understanding of the geographical uh, space. And um, at some point, uh, Hioniadis returned to Constantinople. Um, and when he did that, uh, he had to sign a confession of faith. Confession, the confessions of faith 
were actually used for individuals to testify, to certify that they were still Christians, that were, they were still um, following the uh, dogma of their church, their original church. And here Ioannidis had to sign this document because he has spent so much time in an Islamic country so that some people in Constantinople were not very uh, happy without this document. This is a specific type of document. We have many examples of that. People who came uh, back had to sign or some people who um, became Latins and then they, wa they wanted to, uh, um, they followed the Catholic Church and then they came back to the Orthodox Church. We have uh, very various cases of individuals, especially in the 14th century, who were fluid in their um, faith. We have some examples later on this uh, lecture. And um, after this confession of faith, the faith of the uh, officials in Constantinople was recovered and he was assigned with a new uh, journey. He uh, had to go back to the city of, to go back in this uh, territory, but he now went to the city of Tabriz. And not as a scholar, he went there to be a bishop. Now he was a bishop uh, of a Greek community which existed in Tabriz. Um, since the time uh, Maria of the Moguls was there, she had founded there um, a church and um, there was a Greek community in the city. So he went there as a bishop of Tabriz. Um, the interesting um, fact is that Tabriz, according to the ecclesiastical jurisdiction, actually was uh, a bishopric belong, which belonged to the Patriarchate of Antioch. Um, this is a tradition that goes back to, the, to late antiquity. Um, and this tradition said that pa the Patriarchate of Antioch was responsible for the bishoprics in the Far East, uh, from Far East from the perspective of the Mediterranean. But uh, since the Crusades, the Patriarchs of Antioch were in exile in uh, Constantinople and in this way were uh, very much under the influence of Byzantium. You can see that there is a connection here between Antioch and Constantinople. The um, Bishoprics of the Byzantine Orthodox uh, Patriarchate of Antioch in the 13th um, uh, and 14th century is a very uh, interesting topic. We, see, we saw the case of Hioniades, who came back to Constantinople, but then he became bishop in a bishopric of the Patriarchate of Antioch, because uh, the Patriarchate of Antioch were was actually under the influence of the uh, Ecumenical Patriarchate in Constantinople. Um, it was, let's say, a plan, a scheme of um, the Byzantines to send Hioniades there and um, to have to keep an eye on the situation through a, a person that they know, but still officially he represented the Patriarchate of Antioch. He went to Tabriz as a bishop of Tabriz. Um, the Patriarchate now of Antioch uh, had um, a jurisdiction not only in this region but even far more to the east. Uh, for example, in Baghdad, in Tabriz where also Hioniades went, but also in uh, Romagiris, which uh, at that time it should be located in the city of uh, Samarkand. Romagiris, uh, really, in a way, relates its history to the foundation of Baghdad. It goes back to the 10th uh, to the 8th century. Um, 
when the Abbasid uh, caliphs founded uh, Baghdad, the new capital, um, they had resettled the Christian population far to the east and uh, it's being described um, uh, in, um, uh, in the life of Patriarch, um, the Patriarch of uh, uh, Patriarch uh, Christophorus. Um, and in order to take care of um, this, Greek, this uh, Christian population, a Catholic gate, Catholicos gate, Catholicos gate, took, uh, was formed. It's very difficult to pronounce it anyway. Uh, this uh, administrative uh, uh, unit it demonstrated a jurisdiction above the bishopric, um, and um, because it, it, it encompassed, it had to take care of a, a larger region, so they, they formed this uh, Catholic crusade. And um, it, it's higher, as I said, from a, it's not a bishopric, a bishopric is uh, uh, lower in the hierarchy. And uh, this uh, new administrative church administrative unit was created in uh, Roma Yiris. And um, interestingly, this um, uh, uh, bishopric, let's call it bishopric of Romagiris, traveled, it moved, a bishopric on the move, very interesting, a very interesting phenomenon. Um, not only in one place, let's say from one place to the next, but it depended, this movement depended on where the cent the, this Christian population were, uh, was moving. Uh, in Central Asia. It was a Byzantine Orthodox uh, a bishopric on the move. Um, at first it was uh, probably located in um, Shash. You see the movement of the Christian population to um, far more in, the, in Central Asia. At first, it was um, uh, located in Shaz, Tashkent. Uh, for some time, it was, it was there. Then it moved to Nishapur. And in the 14th century, uh, most probably in Samarkand. Uh, this is the most eastwards dependency of the Byzantine church at that time, the Romagiris. The uh, um, Patriarchate of Antioch hit um, this bishopric, um, well, where the head of it was a Catholic cause, that's why Catholic skate of Romagiris and Persia. And there are descriptions about this um, uh, uh, Romagiris Persia uh, Catholic skate such as the, here you see Tashkent, and here you see also the Nishapur, the very center of this uh, uh, bishopric head. Um, there is a description from Catholic observers, uh, such, as the, uh, such as the one of uh, Hetum of Korikos, Hetum of Korikos was an Armenian, who um, Armenian nobleman, who became Catholic, and um, he even became a Franciscan monk. He wrote a description on the Eastern countries. Quite interesting. They were interested in testifying, describing these regions. It was something unknown. They, they, they wanted to make uh, people, the, the readers. Uh, get to know, to let them know how these uh, communities were looking like and how, what the problems were there. Uh, they were the first instance of information in various cases for the Western uh, readers. He writes here in Latin that in, the, in Central Asia, 
parts, uh, in Central Asian parts, there were um, uh, Christians, uh, Soldans, he calls them Soldans, they are uh, probably the Sogdians, uh, and he mentions that they followed the rites and liturgy of the Greeks, so they are Orthodox. And uh, he adds that et sud obediente, obediente patriarchia diogeno. That means that they were subordinates of the patriarchate of Antioch, not of Constantinople. So that is a confirmation of what I have said before. These bishoprics, these uh, church administrative units were under, in, in these regions, were under the Patriarchate of Antioch. Um, a later description um, is to be found um, in a letter of a Catholic bishop once more, who was sent to Samarkand, uh, Thomas Mancasole. Uh, Thomas Mancasole wrote about also the islands and the Melkites living there. And uh, he says, um, Universis Christianis, Malchaitis and Alanis. Uh, Melkite, Malchaitis, uh, is a Syriac or Arabic name for the Byzantine Orthodox communities in the East. And he speaks also about the islands are going to have a prominent uh, position in our lecture. Um, the uh, letter of uh, Thomas uh, Mancasole, it's also interesting because it illustrates uh, an intensified uh, missionary activity of Catholic monks, uh, which was taking place since the 13th century. Clerics and monks, especially from uh, the uh, Dominicans and the uh, Franciscans, uh, established settlements all over the western uh, realms of the Mughals, especially in the Ilkhanate, that is eastern Anatolia, Caucasus and northwestern Iran. Um, as you can see also uh, from uh, this map, you can see where the uh, Dominicans and the Franciscans had uh, uh, established the settlements. In a way, they followed the administrative geography of the Ilhans, uh, using Tabriz as the center for organizing all the other um, settlements and organize as well their activities. Um, this led uh, later, uh, 1318, to the emergence of a Latin archbishopric in one of the Mughal capitals in Sultaniya. And um, this bishopric had um, under its uh, jurisdiction other bishoprics in Anatolia, for example in uh, Smyrna, today Smyrna, in uh, Sivas and in Tabriz. Later, um, its jurisdiction was extended to Samarkand and um, even to uh, southern India. So we see a Catholic expansion, let's say, with settlements uh, of monks and later, after the settlement of the monks, the Dominicans and Franciscan archbishopric emerged and uh, this um, uh, bishop uh, and bishops, uh, bishoprics even to uh, southern India. Uh, a very wide, let's say, very wide and at the same time ambitious program of the Catholic Church, but it was not uh, very long uh, sustained. Um, it was not long uh, sustained because this was all this was happening when the um, Ilkhanate was weakened, uh, weakened already under the rule of uh, Abu Sa'id, who died in 1335. And after his death, and after his death, um, the Ilkhanate um, fragmented in various polities, and uh, this, of course, affected the chances of the church to keep this far. Um, raged um, uh, bishoprics. Uh, 
the decline now of the Ilkhanate is very important for Byzantium because it affected Asia Minor. Asia Minor and the frontier region to Byzantium. In Anatolia, uh, Turkish princes were under the jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of, uh, of a, a lordship, not jurisdiction, of a lordship of the Ilkhanate. And when this overlordship crashed or weakened, uh, these Turkish principalities emerge and they try to act on their own. They, tried to, they started acting on their own and they tried to expand uh, to the west across the uh, Byzantine frontier. Uh, remember that Constantinople was recovered by the um, uh, uh, by the uh, Latins in 1261, the Byzantines came back, Constantinople became once more uh, the capital of the state. Um, and at that time, Byzantium had under its control uh, northwestern Anatolia, who was the, the center of the Nicene Empire. This changed rapidly in the next decades, and various principalities were emerged in former Byzantine territories up to the middle of the 14th century, up to 1350. Uh, Byzantium lost almost all territories in Asia Minor, with uh, the exception of the city of Philadelphia. Uh, but um, at that time, um, Emirates, Turkish Emirates, appeared in the um, area. One of them was in Bithynia. Um, if you remember, Bithynia was the center of the Nicene state, the state that succeeded later in 1261 to recover Constantinople. Now the Ottoman state had its base in Bithynia as well, uh, in a region um, not far in, in, a, in a region not far away from the city of Nicaea. Especially after the um, the weekend, uh, the uh, the Ilkhanate was weakened, this. Uh, Turkish Emirates were able to establish themselves. The most successful of them was the Ottoman one. Um, in which had a center, Bithynia. In the way, uh, in this way, we have in a way covered the importance of the Ilkhanate for the political, diplomatic and ecclesiastic relations for Byzantium in this period. And it, it shows the, um, the various facets of these uh, relations. They were not only political, they had also other um, uh, aspects. Um, before closing this um, um, chapter and moving to the next uh, region, uh, I would like to uh, come back a little bit to Maria of the Mughals. Maria of the Mughals, when she came back to Constantinople, didn't uh, remain inactive. As I told you, she founded um, a monastery, uh, she became a nun, but at some point her brother, Andronicus II, had this great idea in order to uh, fight the Ottomans to send her sister to Nicaea. The plan was that uh, Maria will come um, uh, to uh, diplomatic negotiations with the Mongols and uh, with the Ilkhanate, and she would propose a marriage alliance with them, and she would negotiate as well with Osman. Um, of course, her status as the, uh, the widow of, uh, the widow of uh, uh, Mughal Khan, her knowledge of the Mughal language and culture clearly recommended her for this embassy. However, uh, and despite the fact that she received the Mughal help in this occasion, uh, in the sources it is attested that she behaved with arrogance toward uh, the Ottomans. Probably it's this aristocratic arrogance that we know in some occasions or because she has 
been in a, in a Mughal environment where women had a different role to play. We cannot say for sure, but this mission actually failed. However, it's interesting the fact that she was sent by her a brother to deal with a very difficult situation in the most important frontier for Byzantium at that time. As we have seen, the other connection is in the direction of the north across the Black Sea, where the Golden Horde now was established with its center at Volga, Volga River, and this was especially uh, relevant, a very relevant area for Byzantium, since it had here a group of bishoprics, which had been established uh, due to the Christianization, especially of Russia, since the late 10th century. There were Byzantine uh, uh, bishoprics in Crimea and northwestern Caucasia, and of course the big metropolis of uh, entire um, uh, Russia, which had its traditional seat in Kiev, but then it moved to Moscow. Uh, the Orthodox Church was accepted by the Mughal uh, rulers, and um, actually um, the Orthodox Church got special privileges. Byzantium was able to send to these uh, territories bishops and metropolitans uh, of Kiev, uh, which was also important in terms of diplomatic influence. At the same time, Byzantium was interested in uh, having good relations to the Mongols of the Golden Horde, who uh, could intervene, as I've told you before, in the Balkans in favor of Byzantium. The link with the Golden Horde, Byzantium and Golden Horde, was uh, confirmed through a marriage link in um, 1270 when Ephrosyne, uh, another daughter of Michael VIII, was sent to uh, marry uh, Nogai, who uh, was ru uh, ruling more or less independently over the western parts of the Golden Horde. And um, the uh, Nogai led campaigns in the Balkans, in Serbia and in uh, Bulgaria neighbors of Byzantium. It was in the interest of Byzantium to have these regions under the threat of uh, Nogai. Of course, Nogai at some point comes um, to a controversy with the Golden Horde. We'll come back a little bit uh, later on that. Um, it was um, important to have good uh, relations to them and with Nogai there was a special connection also through this marriage. So Nogai was the uh, son-in-law of a Byzantine emperor. Uh, for Eprosini we don't know so much uh, so much uh, for, her, uh, for her life. We know that she got married there, she stayed there for a couple of years. Um, the last testimony, the last uh, information we have about her is about 1280 but after that uh, nothing is known about um, her life um, and um, she disappears in a way from the sources. Anyway, through this marriage alliance there was a strong, connections, a strong connection to Byzantium. In Sarai now, uh, the capital of the Golden Horn uh, at the Volga, there was since 1269 around the state uh, an Orthodox bishopric which was subordinate uh, uh, to the Metropolitan of Kiev. Before moving to the, uh, in detail on the um, issues about um, the Golden Horde Byzantium, let me speak a little bit about um, what Byzantine sources say about the Mongols. Um, George Pachimeris, you can see, um, 
portrait of him in an illumination from the 14th century. He was a member of the patriarchal clergy and he wrote a very important uh, historical work uh, about the end of the 13th century and the beginning of the 14th century. He is actually the main source the first instance, if we can call it, uh, about the history uh, of Byzantine history and the relation to the Mughals after uh, 1261 up to 1307 when he finishes his work. He may have died around 1310, uh, it's not exactly known when he died. Anyway, what's important for us today is that he mentions the Mughals many times. And he has a very good knowledge of the, uh, let's say, of the political geography of the Black Sea and of the um, uh, situation there. And um, do not forget that he was a member of the clergy, so she ha he had a, a good knowledge also of the uh, ecclesiastic developments in this region. And um, what is interest interesting is that he speaks about uh, Nogai and he calls him Nogas. And he says, uh, I have written in Greek as well the text of his, and he says that Nogas is a powerful man of the Tohars, Kratistos in Anir to Toharon. Tohars in uh, his phraseology are the Tatars, but he uses Tatars in the meaning of Mongol, uh, Mongols. He says um, uh, Toharus, who they call Mugulius, Mongols. For him, Tatars and Mughals are the same. He speaks also about the rulers and he calls him, uh, the, he says that they have Kanitas, Khan, the Khans, and he translates that in Greek as Archon, as a ruler. Um, in, a, an ex, in, a, uh, in, in a specific point in his narrative, he speaks about the Mughals and he says that they are simple, that they are cooperative with each other, they are clever and very sharp and very decisive in the wars. In their everyday life they are autark and they they do not like luxury. Um, he even mentions Jenkins Khan, um, it's very interesting, he speaks about the Mughals, he says they have a legislator um, I don't remember now his name, but uh, he goes on with uh, speaking about the Mongols and at some point he says, oh, now I remember. His name is Zikiskanis, uh, Jenkins Khan, and he calls him the legislator of the Mongols. It's a very interesting um, narrative. He presents the, uh, the Mongols in some stereotypical, we can say, adjectives about the uh, steppe um, nations, uh, but he, uh, in, he, 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 he puts this narrative in his historiographical work. He has this interest about uh, this uh, um, uh, very uh, important uh, nation, and I have to say that he is in some points uh, in a way impressed, or he gives a positive a narrative about Nokai, for example, um, and uh, he doesn't dismiss the Mughals as, um, let's say, barbarians or primitive or whatever. Um, especially the mention of Tzikis Hanis is very, 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 very funny because uh, he says, yes, I uh, they have a legislator, but I don't remember his name now. Later on, a couple of sentences later, Oh, uh, now I remember, you know, I have, uh, let's say, I remember it now, and he says, Tzikiskanis. He tried to, to, to make it Greek, in a way, Tzikiskan, and he gives this Greek end, ending in order to, 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 to make the name sound Greek. Just a, a very interesting uh, passage in his narrative, and as I've told you, Bachimeris is a very important uh, source, his work is a very important source, not only about the Mughals, uh, in the east and the Golden Horde on the north and Black Sea, but he is the first Byzantine historian who mentions the Ottomans. And he gives um, a detailed narrative about the uh, expansion of the Turkish Emirates in Asia Minor and the loss of uh, the Byzantine um, uh, Asia Minor. Um, let's go back to uh, the Black Sea. 
uh, Nogai, as I've told you, had at some point um, problems with um, uh, or the conflict. Uh, let's to, to say it better. He had a conflict with the Supreme Khan of the Golden uh, Horde. Uh, he was defeated in 1299 and um, he was killed. And um, the power of um, uh, Nogai um, collapsed. His sub empire um, collapsed. This led to uh, migration movements because after the defeat of Nogai, some of his followers tried to flee uh, from uh, Toktai. Uh, especially uh, members of the Yas, the Alans. The Alans are an ethnicity uh, originally set, was, was settled uh, in the northwestern Caucasus and um, in, um, in uh, 1299 uh, they tried to find um, refuge in the Byzantine uh, territory. They moved towards the Tenu uh, Delta to the city of Vicina. They uh, came in contact with the Byzantine bishop there, the bishop of Vicina. And uh, then this bishop arranged um, for a diplomatic exchange uh, with Constantinople. So we see also the role of the church in this situation of crisis for uh, people. The islands were accepted. Uh, in Byzantium, and they were allowed to uh, migrate um, to the Byzantine Empire uh, to Thrace. And uh, importantly, they were integrated in the Byzantine army, um, and uh, especially they played uh, um, uh, an important role in the army of the co emperor Michael IX who uh, at the beginning of the 14th century, around 30. 102. He went to Asia Minor to fight against the Turkish. He was in the region of uh, Magnesium Sipilon, today uh, Manisha, and the islands were an important element in his army. The islands that came to Byzantium from the Black Sea, from um, uh, the um, uh, uh, sub empire of Nogai. At, uh, especially for this year, is uh, uh, important for the further developments in um, Asia Minor uh, because a decisive a defeat uh, of the um, uh, Byzantine army uh, sealed in a way the developments in the first half of the 15th uh, century. You see here how they as well moved to the uh, frontier against uh, the um, Turkish Emirates in Asia Minor. The islands um, originally um, had uh, as um, a center uh, of settlement in northwestern Caucasia, and they had been uh, vassals of the uh, Hazars, the Hazar uh, Hanate an early steppe empire in the region. But in the uh, 10th uh, century, uh, from 914 onwards, parts of the islands had been um, uh, Christianized uh, from Constantinople. So they accepted baptism and the Byzantine church established also their a metropolis, the church province of uh, Alania to which later also the city of Sotiriopolis uh, at the Black Sea coast was uh, added. This uh, bishopric uh, has been um, uh, mentioned, is well known, especially from uh, sigillographical evidence. Uh, you see here uh, Byzantine uh, lead seals. Um, which were used to seal documents. And um, these are seals of the um, uh, Metropolitan uh, Ignatius of uh, Alania. Um, the uh, seals were uh, added by Werner Seibt, one of the leading scholars uh, on matters of the relations between uh, the Caucasus and Byzantium, but also a leading scholar in Byzantine sigillography. 
so you have an idea also how these Byzantine lids, uh, seals were uh, looking like. Um, but as you see, these are seals from earlier periods, not from the uh, late uh, uh, Byzantine uh, period. Um, we have a very interesting text regarding the uh, metropolis of Alania. After the uh, uh, Byzantine church has been established in the uh, Empire of Nicaea, uh, which uh, by now you know was um, one of the Greek successor states after 1204. Uh, this text uh, narrates a travel um, the Metropolitan Theodor, Theodoros uh, had to make um, uh, to Alania. Uh, he was uh, ordained Bishop of Alania and um, he went to travel. He, he had to travel to Alania in 1226. He um, uh, first uh, went to Crimea. And already there, he had uh, he met uh, Alans, who were in a, the in a, there was a diaspora of Alans in uh, Crimea, um, and this Alan community was there even prior to the Mughal expansion. We are in the year twelve twenty six, and um, it's a. Um, um, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a testimony that the Alans were uh, um, not only in the in the region, but they had created communities uh, in um, uh, on the Black Sea and uh, in the steppes, all the way to uh, Central Asia. He went then uh, uh, along the well-known uh, routes to the, to. Uh, to this uh, part of the Black Sea, and he ended up in Alania. Um, what is interesting is what he says about um, the Alans and the Christian faith. Um, he says that uh, they are dispersed, widely dispersed, extending from the Caucasus Mountains as far as the Iberians, the Georgians, their former ancestral uh, borders, and uh, they like to send ma uh, like to send many colonies so that they fill almost the whole of Scythia um, and um, Sarmatia. So Scythia is, um, let's say, Ukraine, um, southern Russia, and Sarmatia. Um, it's in the meaning of the steppes. They uh, uh, to the north, uh, the steppes are to the north of the Black Sea, uh, Black and uh, Caspian uh, Sea. So the, he speaks about this island diaspora, and um, uh, what he says uh, is uh, is interesting. He says that they were Christians only in name, Christiani the monon onomati. So uh, this is a very interesting observation. We will see that it w he was not the only one who says that, uh, and we will see later in which context this um, uh, mention actually um, uh, is grounded and how why what does he, what does he mean by saying that they were Christians only in name um, the widespread of the islands before and after the Mughal conquest is also described by Latin by uh, by Latin Catholic observer uh, John of Pian di Carpine, uh, who uh, led a delegation in 1245 to the Mughals. He wrote uh, about the city of Ugent um, in Horesm. It's an area um, south to the uh, Aral Sea. And uh, he argues the city was densely populated for this for there were many Christians there, namely Gazas, uh, Russians, Alans, and others. Um, so he, he mentioned this uh, Alan diaspora here, and also Russians. The Alans are mentioned once more um, uh, together with other nations. They are not the only Christian population there, but it's interesting that it, it comes 20 years later. After, I mean, later, after uh, the Metropolitan uh, uh, 
Theodorus who traveled to Wallonia uh, in 1226. Uh, so the, uh, this is another confirmation that the islands had already created a, a diaspora um, in, uh, in uh, East and Central Asia, the Far East uh, and Central Asia. Um, another um, describer of uh, perhaps a more prominent describer of the Alan presence of the uh, presence of this Christian element in uh, the Mongol uh, realm is William of uh, Rubruk, who uh, led a delegation uh, all the way to uh, Karakorum. And uh, he uh, speaks about the um, uh, islands, uh, stating uh, that uh, the islands are only in name Christian, solo nomine Christi, etc. That is, he uh, goes in details in this text and um, um, they they know little about the Christian faith. They are Christian, but they know not so much about the um, uh, the Christian faith. Um, we see here in his text that um, uh, William of Rebrook describes um, the uh, situation in Karakorum, and uh, he says that um, um, there was there a great um, multitude of Hagarian, Alan, Russian, Georgian, and Armenian Christians. So they were not the only one Christ, the, the only Christians in Karakorum. There were many others. Um, uh, none had seen the sacraments since they were captive. So they, they were there because they were captive. As they said that the Nestorians, uh, who were um, he, who is a um, uh, uh, Nestorian, Nestorian church, the church com uh, Christian community, but um, of uh, heretic, uh, according to the official church, so they have a heretic um, uh, element, but they were widespread in Central Asia. And the Nestorians, although they were Christians, they did not want to admit them into their churches uh, un unless they were uh, rebaptized by them. And uh, due to this situation, um, uh, they probably had uh, difficulties by living there. And um, we see that Alans, as other ethnic groups, were moved by force to uh, Karakorum. For about the Alans, we hear also in a papal uh, letter dated in 1329, um, uh, also, there is uh, is clear that they were present in Central Asia. Uh, further reference to the prominent presence of the islands um, in the capital of the Golden Horde uh, in Sarai uh, is a letter from uh, the bishop in Sarai who had been established there uh, with the confirmation of the Khan and uh, of the Orthodox Church. He sent a letter at some point to Constantinople that uh, his uh, jurisdiction was under attack by neighboring bishops of Sekhia, uh, who was in the Western Caucasus, as you can see here on the map, and the Bishop of Alania, who uh, is well attested, uh, since members of these bishoprics, uh, Christians of Sehia and Alania, were present in Sarai, and this was used and as a pretext for these bishops to um, claim that also the bishopric of Sarai was under uh, their jurisdiction. So the uh, patriarchate then had to decide what's um, the real situation and to make a decision about uh, in favor of one of the parties. Um, interesting, uh, 
uh, is that we have another uh, description of the existence of Christian communities, uh, Christian uh, clerks, uh, clerics uh, at the Mughal uh, court, even uh, to Karakorum. Um, this is a description of um, Giovanni, who wrote one very important source for the history of the Mughals uh, from the Islamic perspective this time. And um, at the time of the Khan uh, Guyuk, he says that the Christians and the had their priests arrived from all over the territories in the um, uh, Near East. So uh, this is another testimony about um, Christians, uh, even um, in um, Christian clerics, uh, even in uh, Karakorum. Um, that means if, if we can um, deduce uh, from the references of the sources, uh, the islands have been moved to Mongolia like other ethnic uh, groups. They were moved to Karakoru and the Mughal uh, rulers uh, even established uh, troops, regiments based on the islands. They used the islands as the Byzantines did uh, as a part of their army um, uh, in the conquest of China. So we hear the uh, Asud guards from the, 20, the 1240s onwards, and there um, uh, they became a part of the guards of the emperor of China. So, of the Yuan emperors. Um, we hear again from a Latin description around 39, uh, 1311, that, the more th uh, that more than um, 33,000 uh, um, of them were in uh, Kambalik, Beijing. So uh, we cannot be sure about the accuracy of the uh, numbers, but certainly they were a very important part of the Mughal army. Um, when the sources mention the Asud Guards, it can be excluded that they are not all of them islands, but they, the term represented um, Christians in the army of uh, Mughals. Um, they may be may have been Christians from Russia or from northern Caucasus, but it came so that the Asud referred to these Christian elements, these uh, guards of the uh, Yuan emperors, starting from the uh, Alan element. Um, we have biographies um, uh, depicted uh, depict in, in uh, Chinese sources now, or registers, and some genealogists like uh, Alemani, who uh, wrote um, the standard work on the islands, uh, and he could also decipher the Chinese names. And these names are actually coming from uh, four generations, going back four generations of Christian names. And these uh, people had traditional Christian names like uh, Theodoros, Theodor, Georgios, George, Demetrios. Uh, so we see that people um, kept the Christian names um, uh, and they kept, they, they continue to be uh, Christians. Um, even if they have Chinese name, probably they kept the Christian faith. Um, what we had um, in this case is um, is very important. So we see this element attested as well in Chinese sources. And many references to them are, uh, are coming from the from uh, Western uh, Europeans, from Catholics, um, and as uh, it happened with the Ilkhanate. Um, the Catholic Church sent as well bishops to the Mongol uh, uh, realm in China and established there um, also an uh, archbishopric in uh, Kambalik in Beijing. Uh, one of the first archbishops there were, um, was John of uh, Monte Corvino uh, from 1307 onwards, and he wrote uh, that uh, this part of the Christians 
um, uh, he was um, taking care. There was a part of Christians here, there in this region. He was taking care. They were um, they were called Alans. There were thirty thousands of uh, them, um, and they are in Great King Spain. These people and their families turned to uh, Friar John um, of Monte Corvino, and he comforts them and preaches to them. So uh, we see these islands that were moved to Mongolia from the um, former regions, and they were still Christians, but they were lacking a bishop, a priest, um, an Orthodox bishop. Um, that's why uh, they turned to a Catholic one, a Catholic bishop, just in order to have a certain spiritual guidance. They 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 needed. Um, a spiritual uh, guide uh, and the orthodox there was no orthodox bishop there and that's why they turned to uh, the catholic one um, we see uh, the extent of the catholic uh, bishoprics in central asia um, from the black sea to china um, uh, Kambalik was also included this was a very huge uh, uh, area and uh, it was uh, difficult to maintain across uh, the distances between the places. Uh, when um, uh, uh, John um, of uh, Monte Corvino died in 1328, um, uh, for some years there was no bishop and the Alans decided to write to, with the, after the approval of the Khan was uh, gained, uh, they could send a letter to the papal court. At that time, the Pope uh, was uh, not in Rome anymore, but in Avignon. So they uh, sent a letter to Avignon. Uh, and uh, among the other members of the delegation, there was also an Alan, uh, Thogai, Alanus de Cathario. Um, and he was uh, he, he also represented the islands in the papal uh, court the pope from his side benedict the 12th um, uh, he accepted them as his spiritual uh, children and he said that he would also send another bishop in the region for their spiritual guidance this didn't happen um the, because um, these networks of long distance connectivity were uh, shattered in the mid of the 12th, uh, 14th century by the Black Death, which spread from Central Asia to the entire world. Paleogenetics demonstrated that it broke in the late 3030s and via the trite ro uh, routes also spread towards the Black Sea. We have the description of uh, a very interesting description of the siege of Kaffa and Black Sea, where we hear that the Mughals catapulted victims of the Black Death to the city. It was a kind of biological war. Um, from the Black Sea, uh, the plague, uh, plague uh, um, spread across the Mediterranean and Europe. I will not go into depth on the Black Death because I think you have already had the lecture by my colleague Johannes Preiser Capello, so I will not go into, uh, into, uh, into detail about the Black Death, but I mention it in order to show you how this long distance connectivity can be um, can collapse when um, uh, events like the Black uh, Death happen. And um, it was a major event. Uh, one of the most important events in the late Middle Ages. We see the importance of these plagues, of these uh, uh, diseases even uh, today. Um, and um, this uh, plague had um, um, influenced as well uh, the Byzantine Empire. We have um, a, a reduction of the um, uh, Byzantine population, as it is attested in uh, various documents, and um, it it was one of the other facts that were happening. All these events that were happening until the middle of the uh, 14th century um, 
where Byzantium um, was already in a crisis. Um, the Byzantium was in, in the crisis after the uh, end of the 13th century, after the beginning of the 14th century, the, power, the Byzantine power decreased. It was a period not only of the Ottoman expansion, of the uh, Turkish expansion in Asia Minor, of the loss of the Asia Minor, and um, then the uh, Ottoman expansion in the Balkans and the territorial uh, losses uh, there as well. Um, and there was, it was a period of civil wars, of uh, political instability uh, for Byzantium, two civil wars in the 14th century, um, uh, which uh, together with the plague and the other natural catastrophes uh, contributed uh, to, um, uh, they, aggra uh, they um, aggravated the situation uh, which already existed, this crisis in the Byzantine Empire. Um, let's say when one evil comes, uh, many other evils uh, tend to appear. Uh, to paraphrase an, um, an uh, ancient uh, quotation. Um, and this is depicted very vividly in a charter of Patriarch uh, Callistos I of Constantinople, who in this uh, passage clearly mentions all the difficulties the, the state had to uh, deal with all the problems, uh, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, floods, the natural catastrophes, uh, uh, but also fires, the civil wars, and the unexpected swar uh, of the deadly uh, plague, the mutual killings by Christian brothers, so the, the fights among Christian states and, um, and uh, sta uh, Christian nations, uh, the capture of many people, the captives uh, who fell uh, in the heads of the uh, heretic and godless enemies. Here are the uh, Turks actually um, behind this term. Um, it was a period of destruction and crisis. Uh, the patriarch attributes that to the sins of the Christians because of our sins as at the beginning of his charter so uh, he considers the uh, a moral component he, he takes into consideration a moral component behind this crisis in byzantium but he attests also the other factors that contributed natural catastrophes the plague political instability civil wars the constant wars with uh, various enemies so we see that he actually uh, captures the, 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 the critical elements in this um, decline. And um, what is uh, clear is that the Byzantine state, uh, from a medium sized state, it became slowly a small state around Constantinople. Um, you see uh, how the situation changed in a few decades. And it, uh, this got worse later on. However, there was uh, an exception in this picture of crisis, of uh, decline, and this is the church. Um, whereas the political power declined, and the Byzantine state became a minor polity, the Patriarchate of Constantinople was still very influential due to the bishoprics all over the Eastern Mediterranean, the Balkans and the Eastern Europe. So his, the sphere of influence of the Patriarchate was much larger than any political influence of the Byzantine Empire at this state, at this, uh, in this period. Um, Pots uh, wrote that the Patriarch he had remained ecumenical, ecumenical in the sense of a global range of influence. So the Patriarch remained ecumenical, uh, also de facto, because he had his bishops there in these regions, he sent his metropolitan, so he became, he remained an ecumenical Patriarch, the Emperor was not anymore. 
and um, we see that um, this wide range influence of the church was uh, used by the imperial power um, in order to give a kind of prestige in this declined um, political power of Byzantium. One case where during uh, negotiations with the uh, Latins, with the Catholic Church, with the Pope about a possible union of the churches and um, an effort was made in 1274 during Michael VIII, the Union of Lyons, but although it was concluded this union, it was never accepted by the population. It was then uh, rejected once more, and, uh, but the Byzantines never stopped um, putting into the table uh, the um, solution of the union of the churches whenever they wanted help from the West. And there was also in this 14th century the discussion about a possible Western help against the, um, um, uh, against the Turks. And in one occasion, um, uh, the ex-emperor John VI Katakuzinos, you see him, this is an illumination of a, a manuscript. This manuscript uh, is in Paris. And uh, it's interestingly a manuscript that contains his historical work. He, it's, a, it's a history of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, which was wrote, uh, which was written by a, a, an ex-emperor, John the Sixth Katakuzinos, and you see him here uh, being depicted uh, on the one side as an emperor with the imperial insignia, and on the other side as a monk. He became a monk, but still he was influential enough to be uh, uh, considered uh, a person where advice could be taken. So. During this negotiation, um, negotiation, uh, Katakuzinos played uh, an important role. And um, in order to conclude this union, the Byzantines uh, argued that if we want to have a union, we have to invite here uh, a, a wide race of bishops. And then they listed many bishops um, which were under their own jurisdiction. And they say the one of Russia, uh, Trapezunt, Alania, once more Alania is a very important, uh, Zahia, uh, also in the uh, nearby, uh, but also the other patriarchs, Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem, uh, the Catholicos of Iberia, Georgia, the Patriarch of Tarnov of uh, Bulgaria, and the Archbishop of uh, Serbia. Why are they uh, listing all these uh, uh, patriarchates and bishoprics and metropolitan cities? It's because they want they they want to show their sphere of influence as if they, it was also a political sphere of influence, though it was only uh, an ecclesiastical influence. So also the political power could gain um, from uh, the uh, wider, the larger uh, sphere of influence of the Orthodox. Uh, uh, the largest and uh, most important uh, ecclesiastical uh, province uh, uh, in the middle of the 14th century uh, was, of course, the Church of Russia. Um, it's uh, in the middle of the, uh, the 14th century, we have a decline of the Golden Horde and the rise of other powers uh, which are competing uh, each other. Uh, from the one side, we have Moscow, um, which, uh, uh, it's, which influence in increased um, among the other um, Russian principalities, but also the great uh, Duchy of uh, Lithuania. It became a great power and established its power uh, between the Baltic and Black Seas. Um, but they were still pagans at that time, so they could, um, let's say, navigate between the Catholic and the Orthodox Church, arguing um, uh, with both uh, uh, about who is going to, uh, uh, to uh, Christianize them. Uh, and then uh, was also the King of Poland, uh, who became uh, also a great power at that time and expanded to uh, the East. All these powers tried to uh, have influence on the uh, ordination of bishops and since there was originally only one bishopric, the great church of uh, Russia with the, the seat in Kiev, 
Various uh, rulers um, demanded from Constantinople that they should get their own bishop. Uh, that means they wanted that this big church of Russia um, uh, to, uh, to be fragmented, so to be split up. Uh, Constantinople tried for a long time to uh, avoid this uh, fragmentation, and um, unfortunately, at the end, he, um, they had to, uh, to uh, compromise, especially after the king of Poland threatened that if he didn't get a bishop, for the regions he newly uh, conquered from the Russian Mughal sphere of influence, he would uh, let the Christians uh, who were there uh, rebaptized in the Latin Rite. So he demanded for an Orthodox bishop in order the Christians of the newly conquered um, uh, regions uh, so that they remain Orthodox, they would not have to uh, be uh, rebaptized in the Latin uh, Rite. So new bishoprics were established and the unity of the uh, Russian uh, church uh, had been given up eventually. This is a really complicated story um, with the bishoprics and the questions back and forth, Constantinople, Poland, uh, uh, Lithuania, uh, Russia and so on. The major source for all these events is the so-called register of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Um, we have two manuscripts which uh, have uh, uh, traveled to, let's say, to um, uh, from Constantinople to um, uh, the library, uh, the Austrian National Library in Vienna. They were bought in Constantinople in the 16th century and um, they were then given to the uh, National uh, Library. Uh, these, two man uh, these two manuscripts contain um, over 800 documents from the Patriarchate of Constantinople and um, a new edition of uh, this um, important source is being um, undertaken here in, uh, in um, the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Um, you see how these uh, documents look like. Here is, for example, uh, another example of a confession of faith. You can see it on your left. Uh, with the cross as a signature from the uh, person who um, became orthodox. Um, and these two manuscripts contain also all the quarrels about Russia and uh, all this um, uh, difficult situation uh, in uh, the Black Sea. But it's very valuable uh, because otherwise we would have known few, uh, very little about the history of the church uh, and also the influence of the Ecumenical Patriarchate and the influence of Byzantium or non-influence of Byzantium in these uh, regions. Um, what we see also from these documents, which have survived in the uh, Patriarchal Register, is that the Patriarchate in Constantinople tried to uh, reorganize the bishoprics there um, and elsewhere in order to maintain um, also on a reduced material basis um, these bishoprics um, uh, and some of them were merged with other ones uh, in a form of action which is called epidosis. Uh, you see here in a visualization how the bishoprics were then connected through these epidosis. One bishop was responsible not only for his bishopric but also uh, for another one who, uh, which in many instances were, was far away. Um, one bishopric was let's say in Asia Minor and the other one was in central Greece or even uh, uh, far more uh, reach, uh, far more uh, in a longer distance. Um, but um, among these um, bishoprics, about um, among these metropolis and bishoprics, uh, which were were very important at that time, was still Alania, Alania. Uh, and uh, this bishopric was still very important um, as a, uh, an uh, important intermediator uh, also for the Black uh, uh, Sea, uh, especially after the um, middle of the uh, 14th century and the plague and the incipient decline of Byzantium. And um, um, we see uh, this importance and especially the special position of the metropolis of Alania in a very interesting case, which is also registered in this patriarchal register, uh, where um, the um, 
uh, metropolitan of Alandia was involved in the case of conversion. We will come back uh, in a couple of minutes. Just to uh, say uh, here, because you see that I mentioned the word Musulmanizo, his, it's about somebody who became Muslim. And this Musulmanizo, it's uh, an hapax, so it's only mentioned once in the, in the Byzantine source, in the Greek sources, uh, in order to demonstrate, to, to, to say uh, that somebody became Muslim. And uh, this um, is related to the area, uh, the area of influence of the Metropolitan of Alania. Uh, and it's located around Tana. Uh, Tana, which uh, despite the, the Black Death, despite the various difficulties in the uh, region, uh, uh, still um, uh, continue to be uh, in uh, mercantile connections all around the Eastern Mediterranean, um, but also uh, you see uh, with places like Tabriz and uh, Sarai and so on. We have the uh, notarial uh, records of the Venetian Benedetto Bianco for this uh, period, for the period of 1359 uh, 1360. Um, so you see how this, uh, on the base of this document, we can see how Tana remained an important uh, node in these uh, mercantile uh, um, uh, networks. And uh, interestingly, from these uh, notarial acts, we uh, from these notarial records, we hear about the slave trade um, in the region. Uh, we hear about slaves of various uh, origins, um, Tatars, Circassians, Mughals, and so on. But even a Chinese um, uh, slave is also mentioned in the um, documents. Uh, and um, from Pegolotti, which who I mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture, Francesco Begolotti um, and La Pratica della Mercatura. Uh, we have also um, uh, the uh, information that Tana was the point, uh, the starting point for a journey to China. So it's an important node in this transregional, um, let's say global trade that was taking place at that time. And among all this, uh, uh, in all this complex situation in the region, we have uh, the Metropolitan Simeon of Alania, uh, who uh, had to come to, he had to go to Constantinople, uh, not because he had trade, trading activities, but he had to go to Constantinople to, to um, it was a court, he had to present himself in front of the Patriarch and the Synod. And the problem was that some priests of his uh, uh, church had complained about them. These priests were in Tana. And they said that uh, Simeon and his brother were um, actually um, uh, trespassing their lands and there were some disputes about them, about properties of the church, properties of the priests. And uh, due to this uh, conflict, uh, the priests uh, um, uh, complained to the Patriarch. The Patriarch invited Simeon to visit Constantinople. And um, uh, the Synod decided that he had to pay uh, the priests for their losses from all these uh, economical uh, problems. His brother was not so very uh, much in fond of giving back money that he has he had taken. And in order to avoid that, he became Muslim. Uh, and um, uh, Simeon from his part um, received the privileged uh, charter from uh, the uh, uh, Khan of the Golden Horde. The Greek source um, names this uh, charter the Alichion, uh, Yarlich. Um, and so both Simeon and his brother tried to avoid uh, this um, uh, solution of the problems they had with the priests. And um, one became Muslim, and this was a brother of Simeon, of an Orthodox Metropolitan. Big scandal in the Orthodox Church, we can say, the Patriarchate. 
uh, red alarm uh, in a way uh, what's going on and um, the uh, situation was that Simeon uh, um, uh, did not Simeon did not become Muslim but still it was a provocation for the church to have somebody in the metropolitan uh, see that uh, his wh whose brother was um, Muslim uh, on the back you can see this network of the brother of Simeon how was he connected positively or negative uh, with um, uh, uh, people around him and if we go a little bit further we see that Simeon and his brother especially Simeon here um, he had contacts in three different uh, spheres of influence he had uh, um, uh, the support of the emperor of Trapezunt. The Byzantine emperor supported him as well. And also the, uh, the Han of the Golden Horde. So the political powers supported him. But you see in green all these other people that did not support him. And uh, we see how Simeon who could play this game between the various spheres of influence and the various uh, centers of power. He was uh, temporarily only deposed from his position. And um, uh, the, the important element is not only the description of all this interesting story about the clerics in this uh, metropolis, the influence that he had, but also this political element that got uh, into this uh, situation. So we see that how important uh, the Metropolitan of Alania could be, both in ecclesiastic, but also on political uh, terms. So we see it also on the geographical sphere, how, how far his uh, influence uh, uh, went. Um, but of course, he, 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 he he did not expand towards Central Asia. So he, he had a specific uh, area of influence, let's say, uh, around the Caucasus, the Black Sea, uh, um, and um, the Byzantine capital. But still, it's, it's really impressive. Uh, another important, um, uh, another, let's say, fascinating career uh, was the one of uh, Pavlos, Paleologos Tagaris. Tagaris was a member of a very prominent um, uh, Byzantine aristocratic family. Uh, at some time, at some point, he used the name Paleologos family name, but this was not accurate to do. That was not the right thing to do, um, uh, because Paleologos uh, family, Paleologos family was the ruling dynasty, so there must have been a connection to this. There was a very distant connection, but really he misused uh, the family name Paleologos. Anyway, his career started by an, uh, from an unhappy marriage um, and then it went to a migration to Palestine where he became a monk. If we follow his trips, it's quite interesting to see the Eastern Mediterranean, the, the regions where the Golden Horde were, where the Ilkhanate were, uh, and uh, where the Mongols were, and, uh, the, uh, the West, but he went also to the West. If we follow his travels, not only his career and his travels, it's 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 a fascinating um, route. It's a fascinating travel. So he he started in Constantinople. He went to Palestine. He returned to Constantinople. He had to leave Constantinople because he did once more something bad. He was uh, trying to to gain uh, profit from a wonder working icon. He returned to Palestine. He uh, became a deacon. Once more, he left Adioch. Uh, he, he left uh, Jerusalem. He went to Antioch. And then he became a priest. He traveled to Asia Minor. But then he said, I'm a patriarch, the patriarch of Jerusalem. And um, he claimed also to be a metropolitan of Iconium, Konya, uh, the former capital of the Rome Sultanate. He even installed a bishop there without having um, the, the, the authority for that. He installed a bishop for Limnia, which is a bishopric at the Black Sea. 
he didn't stop there. He was um, uh, prosecuted by uh, delegates of the Patriarch of Constantinople. He escaped to Georgia and he acted as a bogus patriarch. And from Georgia, went to Trapezunt and uh, there he met the Patriarch of Antioch and the Patriarch of Antioch, in, in order in a way to uh, avoid the, the scandal, he consecrated him Bishop of Tavrizion, of Tabriz. Um, he was then uh, caught from the ones uh, who were looking for him, the ones from the Constantinople uh, Patriarchate. Uh, he escaped uh, to Crimea, he went to the realms of the Golden Horde, um, he went then to Hungary and finally to Rome. He even converted to, Catho uh, to the Catholic uh, Catholicism. He, ordin uh, he was an uh, ordinate Latin Patriarch of Constantinople uh, and he went to Negroponte, the island of Pavia. Um, let's say he moved also in the uh, Latin bishoprics of the Eastern Mediterranean as a, a Latin a Patriarch of Constantinople. He returned uh, to uh, Rome, he was imprisoned, but then uh, he was released. Back, he went to France, but at some point he was uh, covered, he was, uh, all his uh, schemes were, were re uh, revealed and he uh, later uh, went to Constantinople where he confessed all his travels, all his, uh, uh, all his deeds. Um, and this is a case of catch me if you can. So he went uh, from one place to the next one. It's quite interesting how easily he could move in these areas and he knew how to manipulate the system. He knew what to say to the ones, uh, to the one group, to the other group, to the patriarch of the one patriarchate, to the um, local populations. He could move in so many different cultural uh, environments. It's quite uh, interesting how uh, Tagaris was able even to be assimilated, to be a part of the Catholic Church, of the to, to reach even the, the, the King of France. And as I've told you, um, uh, Tagaris, um, this, uh, uh, let's say, Bogus Patriarch, was also the last bishop, um, yeah, bishop of Tabriz, in 1375, and um, 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 the, um, the the thing is that um, the um, at that time, around that time, the title of Catholicos of Romagiris um, was merged with the title of the Catholicos of Georgia. So. In a way, the uh, Patriarchate of Antioch gave up this region, this, the Christians in this region. Um, we can assume that um, the number of uh, Christians uh, in the area of Romagiris declined, but we have no idea what happened. The only testimony, uh, the only information we have is that uh, at some point the two um, Catholic uh, the, the, the two Catholic uh, became one. Um, yes. A reduction of the influence uh, in the regions of the former uh, Golden Hall uh, is also attested uh, in the case of um, uh, Lithuania, uh, decrease of influence of the Orthodox Church in this region, when uh, uh, the uh, Grand Prince of Lithuania in uh, 1385, uh, 86, uh, married the princess of uh, Poland, and this way he uh, entered the sphere of influence of the Catholic Church. And uh, you see here um, a depiction with all the regions that are following the Catholic Church. Among them is also the Orients, um, let's say Tabriz and and so on. But now also Lithuania uh, is uh, added to uh, the churches uh, of the uh, um, uh, Catholic uh, Church, the, the churches that are following the, the, the Catholic um, uh, 
um, we see that um, the Catholic Church was making an impressive use of the new opportunities uh, of the Pax Mogolica um, with uh, archbishoprics in Sultania uh, and uh, Beijing. Um, but the Patriarchate of Constantinople or Antioch were more uh, limited in, in, uh, in its perspective. Um, um, but um, they, they said bishops to Tabriz and Romagiris, but um, there was no effort, for example, to establish um, a bishopric, an orthodox uh, bishop, uh, bishopric in uh, Kambalik, um, which it would have been possible since the islands were there. But they never made this step. Um, so the Patriarchate of Constantinople could have been an even more ecumenical Patriarchate, but they never made this step towards this uh, direction. Uh, of course, uh, even the Catholic Church, which did this uh, step, um, uh, realized that this model was not sustainable. Uh, an interesting figure is Archbishop uh, John of uh, Sultanija, uh, the former capital of um, uh, uh, Mughal capital of Iran. He became ambassador of uh, Tamerlane, and um, uh, Tamerlane was the, la uh, the last uh, representative of a Mughal attempt to establish an empire in Western uh, Eurasia. Uh, John of Sultanija uh, wrote um, uh, also. Uh, a libellus uh, to um, uh, libellus de notitia orbis, uh, a description of his uh, archbishopric, uh, speaking um, about um, the the archbishopric of uh, Sultania, um, and um, he uh, uh, argues that uh, the Pope uh, installed the Church there as archbishopric, quasi of the empire, entire Orient. Uh, uh, and set its borders from Turkey until India, Ethiopia, and gave many bishops to it for support and granted very unique graces. It begins in India Minor, it extends to the West until Greater Armenia. Um, also here, um, a demonstration of the influence this um, uh, archbishopric had and also the influence of the Catholic uh, Church in the region. Um, he tries to give uh, an impression that this huge bishopric was still intact, but already at the end, um, uh, uh, the end of the Mughal uh, rule in Iran had happened. The Black Death, the devastation of the campaign uh, of Tamerlane, also contributed um, uh, to the disappearance of these bishoprics one after another. Um, the bishoprics uh, um, are uh, mentioned sometimes only once, like the one in India, and never again. Uh, many of these places were given up. Um, some of them were still maintained with the help of uh, the Unitores, which were Armenians who converted to, the, to Catholicism, and they were an indigenous element in this region, and they, um, uh, they were ordained um, because they lived there, so uh, they had also an interest to, to keep the church there alive. But uh, even uh, so, in many cases, um, they were uh, bishops only by name. And in the 15th and 16th centuries, uh, these uh, bishoprics disappear altogether. Um, Timo Leng is uh, uh, strongly related to the fate of Byzantium. Um, one, it was the last Mughal uh, figure, important figure for the Byzantine affairs. Um, uh, we already discussed that the Ottomans had expanded uh, and also in the Balkans, not only in Asia Minor, but also in the Balkans, and they were threatening uh, Byzantium. Uh, they realized that they could even um, capture Constantinople. One first attempt happened in 1394 with uh, Bayezid I. Um, uh, 
the, Christ, uh, the, the Emperor Manuel II went to the West to uh, seek for help. Um, a crusade took place and um, with the United uh, Western source, uh, forces. Uh, the battle in Nicopolis, however, in 1996 uh, was a disaster and um, the, um, uh, the hopes um, were lost at that time, uh, also for the people in Constantinople. Uh, but uh, the uh, capital, the Byzantine capital, was uh, saved when uh, Timurleng um, uh, fought the Ottomans in uh, Anatolia and uh, the Battle of Ankara took place in 1402. Um, Bayezid um, was um, uh, kept a hostage and um, this meant uh, certainly the uh, uh, salvation for the time being for Byzantium. Um, there was then a period of time when Byzantium was um, uh, not any more threatened, uh, not so strongly threatened by the Ottomans. Here you see also the locations uh, that are important for this um, uh, for this uh, uh, crusade. Uh, people were uh, talking about the miracle of Ankara, so uh, uh, the city was saved uh, through a divine. Uh, help. Those are the Mongols were here, the divine element that saved uh, Constantinople. It was also the intervention of the uh, Holy Mother of God, Theotokos. Uh, we must not forget that the city of Constantinople was considered that uh, was protected by uh, the Mother of God. And um, uh, even when the, the problems um, augmented, when the years were passing and um, the the, the uh, danger from uh, the Ottoman threat became clear. Many of the people uh, were thinking that um, a divine in, uh, divine event will happen again and we will be saved. Uh, when um, and the, the, these uh, people were not uh, very um, convinced that the Byzantine Church had to go with a union with a uh, to a union with the Catholic Church. So they uh, they. Uh, were not happy with the efforts of the Byzantine emperors for the union of the churches, which continued. We have seen once in the one in the middle of the four, uh, 14th century. Now we see another one, which was actually concluded in Ferrara, Florence, in 1439. Um, but um, uh, they were thinking that we don't need the union, we don't need the Western help. Um, we will manage. Um, a divine help will come, like the Mongols last time. Uh, and when another crusade uh, and the Battle of Varna in 1444 took place, and once more the crusaders were uh, defeated by the Ottomans, um, uh, this, uh, say, uh, this demonstrated to their eyes that the Westerners anyway cannot help us because, you, you look, they, they lose uh, on the battlefield. Um, Unfortunately, or um, as the events went, uh, uh, took their uh, route, took their way, uh, the Ottomans succeeded in uh, conquering uh, Constantinople, uh, in capturing Constantinople in, um, at the end of May 1453. Uh, the Sultan was in this case Mehmed uh, uh, II. And uh, interestingly, there was no Byzantine emperor in, anymore, but there was still a patriarch. The first patriarch after the capture of Constantinople by the Ottoman was uh, Georgios, uh, George Gennadios Holarius. And here you see um, a depiction of Mehmed II and the first patriarch uh, uh, of Constantinople after uh, 1453. Um, and the patriarch remained the um, uh, overlord of the Orthodox in the Ottoman Empire. Um, an interesting aspect is that the Ottomans integrated various imperial traditions in their own uh, uh, ideo ideology. 
there were the sultans in the Muslim tradition, but there were also the um, Vasilevs, they were the Kaiser Irum. Um, you see here on the slide, uh, Bayezid II, which is depicted in a way that resembles the Byzantine emperor as he was in the Union of Ferrara Florence. So we see this imitation of imperial uh, tradition, the Byzantine uh, imperial tradition. They kept also the Sultan tradition, the, the Muslim tradition of that. And uh, another uh, interesting um, self depiction is the one of uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, his, magnif uh, his uh, fantastic tiara. Um, so we see all these traditions at, uh, at the same time, there were also the, the Han, there were also Khans, so in the tradition of uh, the steppes. Um, this was a very long journey, I think, up to now. Um, we went from a situation that ha arose when the Mughals uh, expanded in Anatolia and Black Sea. We demonstrated the problems uh, or the possibilities these invasions meant for Byzantium, the cooperation or non-cooperation between them, how Byzantines tried to have uh, an influence in the developments. We saw the leading role of the church in uh, giving a global character of the Byzantine influence in, 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 in Central Asia and, um, and beyond. And at the same time, we were able to see the fate of some individuals, of some groups, of the, to see movement of people, migration of people, forced and non-forced mobility of these persons uh, in and out of Byzantium. Some were leaving Byzantium to go uh, uh, to the Mughal territories, either for reasons of education or because they became bishops there or because they, were, they wanted to become a bogus patriarch. We saw also uh, these um, uh, liquid identities these people had in some occasions, people living on frontier zones, uh, people who moved between centers of power, like the Metropolitan Simeon of Alania. Uh, but at the same time, we see that um, people were identified as Christians even far away from the major centers of Christianity, the islands in Beijing, um, the islands that had a diaspora all over Central Asia, up to China. And uh, they were seeking the uh, um, guidance, the spiritual guidance uh, from a bishop. And the islands were also a connector between these Mughal uh, states and um, Byzantium. They were both serving there, but they were serving also in uh, the Byzantine army. We see how many connectors were there, actually, between uh, the Mongol empires and uh, Byzantium. Um, we uh, hopefully demonstrated the um, somehow um, neglected until now influence of Byzantium or the Mongol influence in the uh, Byzantine affairs. And I hope I was able to show you how important this global perspective is for the Mughal studies, but also for the Byzantine studies. And I hope that it was interesting for you. I hope you have questions on the topics I was able to uh, put in this presentation. I will be happy to hear your questions on uh, um, every uh, topic that may have not been so clear. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And once more, Thank you very much for the invitation to present this topic um, uh, and uh, to present this topic to you. Thank you.